Hi, everybody. This is David Nevins for City Biz List, and welcome to our program today. And we have a very special guest. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Ken Solomon. And Ken is the president of the Tennis Channel. Ken, welcome to our program. Oh, David, it's good to be here with you. And it's um, particularly an interesting time, I'm sure, for you because um, this uh, we are being uh, uh, inter- we are having this conversation uh, during the U.S. Open. And I know you uh, you stepped away from the court, not that you were playing on the court, but you stepped away from. Uh, your your work uh, on the courts to uh, to join us today, and we're particularly pleased about that. Thrilled to be here as uh, the stars are out there, and we'll be back with them soon. But it's a pleasure. So, Ken, uh, you know, a number of people um, uh, are likely unaware of the fact that uh, the Tennis Channel is uh, owned by Sinclair Broadcast Group, and Sinclair is. Uh, one of the most significant, one of the largest companies uh, based in the Baltimore metro area in in Hunt Valley, uh, to be exact. Um, talk a little bit about um, how that came to be and um, your role with the Tennis Channel. I know you've been a uh, a sports and media and business mogul for uh, uh, several decades. And uh, how, how did this all come together? Uh, your being with the Tennis Channel and the Tennis Channel uh, being with Sinclair. Well, thanks, David. It's actually fairly serendipitous and not coincidental or or maybe highly coincidental. The tennis prominently uh, is a is a huge part, rather, I should say, of the story behind uh, Tennis Channel and Sinclair in that I have known Sinclair uh, through my other positions prior to this in the entertainment business, going all the way back to when I was in my mid-20s. And uh, we developed a relationship both in business and on the tennis court, Um, and uh, both went very, very well. And um, we started, I had a number of things in my career. I was at Universal and DreamWorks and Paramount and Disney, all during some really exciting times of those studios and the evolution of the media business, which never stops evolving. Uh, And Sinclair continued to grow and we continued to find ways to do business and remain friends. And Tennis Channel got to a point where we were really at an impasse because we were an independent network, something that two words that don't go together very often anymore in that we weren't owned by one of the major conglomerates like a Comcast or a Disney or a Fox, all the places I had worked. Um, And, uh, we needed some help because it, getting distribution, if you weren't part of a big, um, one of the big sort of media conglomes, was getting harder and harder. And I called up David Smith and said, look, uh, I think I have a great match here. We have really something that is still in many ways in its infancy. And this is five and a half, six years ago. Um, in Tennis Channel, it's a sports network. The sport itself is benefiting from the technology as it emerges, and we can talk more about that. And Sinclair being now the largest broadcast TV station group in the United States with affiliates all over the country doing good and serving their local communities um, has the right profile to help us with the cable operators to, uh, to get our fair shake, is to be honest. And so David thought that was an interesting idea Chris Ripley came in around that time as well and was given the mandate to grow the company. And we became the first foray for Sinclair into both national programming, cable programming, and sports all at once. It's been a phenomenal relationship. Uh, We call Sinclair the great emancipator because without them, I don't know that we could have survived as crazy as that sounds because now people take Tennis Channel and all the different sort of elements of the portfolio uh, of Tennis Channel, the podcast network, and the streaming, all the things we can talk about. They take it for granted and Tennis.com, which uh, we were able to acquire because of our um, ownership uh, by Sinclair. So today we sit here with really an incredibly exciting, uh, robust network that's growing by leaps and bounds, not only in the US, but globally. And really much of that, if not most of that, is thanks to Sinclair Sinclair's support in seeing what we do in saying, hey, you guys do this. You are a pure brand play. 
That fits well with our broadcast company. Since then, obviously, the regional sports networks have become a part of our life. I think those things are obviously tied together. We were a little mm-hmm. proof of performance. Right. That, that that merging a you know local broadcast business, albeit a large one, uh, with cable networks, in this case, regional cable networks, uh, could also be a good fit. Um, and very very synergistic and create efficiencies and create better products for consumers and better connectivity. And you look, I think Sinclair's strength has always been a couple of things uh, nationally. One is the, though they are national now, they have always understood local markets, local markets in terms of consumer tastes. I remember when they put on their first newscast. Um, and today, obviously, that you know, they cover hundreds of stations with, with local news and millions and millions of viewers who rely on them every day for their information in their local markets. They know how to do commerce in local markets as well, and have really done a tremendous job in treeing all that up to also understanding how that can work nationally and finding the right balance. And generally, you have one or the other. Sinclair is a rare case of both, a strong national network that has at its essence not just a broadcasting but a technology background and Sinclair is you know I think that's the other thing that most people just don't realize there's a huge technology infrastructure that supports the broadcast TV stations and for us here at Tennis Channel that was a godsend because it allowed us to realize our full potential with the benefit of the great engineering prowess and technology prowess that Sinclair has in the broadcast business, in their relationships with virtually every provider in the business and always pushing the envelope, whether it be with ATSC 3.0, uh, you know, or just the next broadcast standard or building beautiful studio facilities like this one, which we have in Los Angeles. I'm actually not in Los Angeles. And right. again, thank you, Sinclair, because they made it look like I am. That's terrific, Ken. And, um, uh, obviously, it's uh, it's quite a match, but I understand also that you know your role. You've been quite transformational at the Tennis Channel uh, as well, both in terms of uh, your programming. I think uh, when you got there, you guys probably weren't covering the majors and a number of the <laughs> things we're covering today, and also uh, uh, from a technological standpoint. So uh, take a couple minutes and tell us about how you grew the programming coverage at the Tennis Channel, and then a little bit, I know you want to talk a little bit about your new technology, and you have a partnership with Samsung that just uh, started. So um, I know that's probably not three minutes worth of stuff, but uh, <laughs> but that's all I'm going to give you anyway. All right. Well, I'll try to do it in three minutes, and you can drill down if you want to anywhere, or we'll, we'll tell people how to find us. Um, look, I think at its essence... It's a funny story, but the, the the original founders of Tennis Channel included uh, many blue chip CEOs in the media business who said, you know, the sport really needs a platform. It's a it's a different kind of sport because it's every day, it's round the clock, it's played in multiple places around the world simultaneously, and there's really no way to do it on traditional platforms uh, as they existed. Um, in 2004, <laughs> you know, when this idea was being hatched, I came in around two, 2003, 2004. I came in in 2005. Um, our, and I thought it was a crazy idea at first. I knew a lot about tennis, even though I was a broadcast executive. I happened to, as I said, play, used to play tennis with David and grew up in a, in the tennis world, was a ball boy, all that sort of stuff that comes with being part of the culture. And I also knew what it was like to not be part of the culture and how hard it was to gain accessibility to tennis and an appreciation for this thing that people become so addicted to watching because it's so exciting, because it's an individual sport, because it's gender neutral between men and women. Men watch women as much as they watch men. Last night will be a record-breaking rating for sure. And uh, obviously it was both Serena Williams and a woman that most hadn't heard of until last night probably, but they won't forget her after that. Um, and so much more. And uh, it is uh, played around the world with the same rules. It is played both locally and by kids and adults alike on the amateur basis globally. Every country in the world feels like tennis is their own. And so there's something to this sport that is actually the oldest 
sport and the oldest vocation. It's older than bike riding. Uh, why <laughs> is it still around? Why can you not get a seat tonight? Why is my phone blowing up? Um, because tennis has always had this attraction. And so we sought to build a media platform that allowed fans to, whether new or old, to attract new fans into the fold to understand what the fuss was all about. And the beauty is that once you discover the sport, unlike others where it's once a week, just a couple of times, you know, through a, a limited time of year, tennis is round the clock all day long, every day, played in multiple courts, in multiple locations, simultaneously with the biggest players in the world, basically 365 days a year, meaning that if you like it, you can get it whenever you want it. Mm -hmm. And that's what people wanted. And so our job was simply to ride the technology. And as Eric Abner, who is sitting right next to me, our head of communications always says, technology finally caught up with the sport. And we were able to build a program service across all platforms, taking advantage of them, and we can talk specifically or not, um, uh, that, that lets people enjoy the sport the way they want to. Some you know, younger audiences just want the social media from Naomi Osaka and Corey Goff and maybe Roger Federer or Carlos Alcaraz, you know, depending, or or uh, Stefano Tsitsipas, who is a pretty good looking guy, I'm told, um, <laughs> you know, or maybe it's the, the scores on a live basis. And so go to tennis.com and open up that draw sheet and you will, whatever's going on in the tennis world, you will instantly be in real time with real time scoring, know everything that used to happen before and everything that's happening now. And along the way, we got to 65 million Cable subscribers, we've launched T2, which is a full second tennis channel. We'll talk about that on Samsung TVs. Already in 30 million homes. It took us 15 years to get the first 30 million. Uh, and this one we launched in a day. It's completely different from Tennis Channel. It is Tennis Channel 2 called T2. It's free once you buy a Samsung TV set. And after March, other our exclusivity with Samsung will lapse and anyone who buys a smart TV will be able to get T2 for free. And it's a compliment to Tennis Channel. And then we've got the streaming service with Tennis Channel Plus, right? So if you just want to go back and watch matches you missed, or you want to choose between any one of the 20 courts that we're covering at somewhere like the French Open, you can do that. And you can do it affordably and you can get information on instruction and take that knowledge out to the court with you. And what we've been able to do is create a continuity of fandom and viewership among a segment of people from a business standpoint that tend to be the highest income audience in all of television. It's also right. the only sport where, again, when you have a 50-50 gender split, you're able to sell male and female demographics, which is really good for the Sinclair bottom line, because we can go in and sell Gillette as well as we can go in and sell Noxema or Pantene, uh, you know, if you're in the uh, hair and cosmetics area, as opposed to just one or the other. And that means twice the universe to be able to reach to. Um, so there's a lot. And it yeah. just, and we keep saying, stand back. We don't know how big this thing's going to get. Because again, there was a time when people didn't think you could even have a tennis channel. And now we've got, in a way, four or five plus globally more. And it's there's no stopping us now. It, Ken, a, a fascinating conversation. And we really only have a minute or two more. But in terms of how big you're going to get in your next thing, I, I don't ex I, I don't think you're necessarily expecting this uh, question, but it just popped into my head as a uh, I'll say um, for the most part, uh, more of a former tennis player than a current tennis player, but a new pickleball player. Yeah. Do, do you have plans to move in uh, in that direction with any pickleball coverage? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we have just aired the uh, several pickleball events. We uh, have been working closely with the PPA, which is the Professional Pickleball Association. You know, to, to us, in many ways, a court's a court. If you go back historically, we did ping pong and badminton and racquetball, but few have the pure scaled growth pattern that we're seeing with this sport. I think everyone who's listening to this uh, podcast will know that, uh, or report will know that it, it pickleball is, is a phenomenon, a bona fide phenomenon in that it is both highly social and yet it brings much of what you enjoy about tennis. It was sort of an idea conceived between tennis and ping pong because, you know, there's that social element, you know, right. it's real hard for a good tennis player to enjoy playing with someone who's a beginner for very long. 
unless right. they're getting a lesson or getting paid. With pickleball, a great player can play with a new, a novice player and have a good time. And yet the pro game is fascinating. And because of the kitchen, which is that little area in the middle, right. you get doubles speed of, of the ball flying back and forth in a way that tennis that even tennis doesn't have. And we just stick that camera right on the middle court and you see all four players, their hands look like they're leaving their bodies. They're moving so fast. So we see big youth numbers driving into pickleball. Now we may well think about doing a pickleball platform uh, at some point, there seems to be the demand there and it would be a perfectly natural thing to extend off of tennis channel. Well, pickleball does seem here to stay, at least uh, at least among my uh, friends of of, uh, of my age. My my son, uh, you and I have uh, briefly discussed. He he's in New York. He's in Brooklyn. I think he uh, told me he's the seventh or eighth ranked uh, amateur tennis player in Brooklyn, New York, which is a pretty big deal. So he, I can't win. I can't win a point. Uh, maybe a point, but not. Uh, Certainly not a game ever from him any any longer, and uh, so I'm going to try to get him to start playing pickleball with me <laughs> I maybe have a better shot. Hey Ken, just in closing, you're you're sitting there in New York. Uh, this is going to run uh, while the U.S. Open is still taking place. Yeah. Any quick last thoughts on uh, the U.S. Open from your perspective? One of the most knowledgeable guys in the uh, in the tennis world for sure. Uh, what, what's what's uh, what's happening there? Well, I'd urge people, if nothing else, to pay attention every day because, you know, when the old way of broadcasting, you kind of got to see the middle weekend and the finals and everything else kind of got lost. And there were a couple of names that surfaced and everything else uh, was sort of secondary. And the reality is that the greatest matches you'll ever see can happen and do generally happen every single day of an event like this. You'll see life and death struggles between the best players in the world who are in a sudden death contest with people who may be a challenger. And so, you know, if nothing else, don't buy for a minute that there's every bit of chance that first round can be as if not more exciting or powerful, often is, usually is, than the finals. There's nothing better than hoisting a trophy. But watch it all, enjoy it, and then uh, we'll be here for the entire rest of the year. Watch our morning show um, on the East Coast. We're, we're nine. Uh, what time are we in the morning? <laughs> yeah, it is nine o'clock. I'm thinking West Coast because they're getting in the studio at 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. Um, but uh, 9 to 11 uh, on the on, and uh, obviously 6 to uh, 8 on the West Coast where they're finishing up by the time we're having breakfast. If you've missed anything or to prepare you for the day, it's TC Live with the biggest, all of our big stars from Lindsay Davenport and John Wertheim from Sports Illustrated and 60 Minutes who's been with us. And it's just, uh, it's fabulous. It'll be the best two hours you spend all day. Ken, uh, thank you so much for your time um, and uh, your your uh, very interesting comments about the partnership with Sinclair uh, Broadcast Group. Uh, who knew? Uh, and uh, good luck at the U.S. Open. We all look forward to the uh, to the next couple of weeks watching watching your coverage, uh, watching future coverage of pickleball. Uh, uh, you're you're doing great things at the Tennis Channel. Sinclair Broadcast Group is doing great things as well. Ken Solomon, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, David. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for watching today.